people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say, that's the bad guy. Okay, and now it's time for our weekend recap. We're going to kick it off with the featherweight title fight in Germany. See Germans. Where the hometown fighter Nina Meinke met former Argentinian champion Daniela Bermudez for what is or what was the vacant IBF title that she so won over 12 three-minute rounds. It's hers now. Though not without some protests from the Argentines, OR Promotions, who promotes Daniela Bermudez in their native Argentina said in a very close match where Nina Menka tried to survive during several assaults, the local overcame Daniela Bermudez by majority decision, keeping the featherweight IBF title. In a meeting that took place this afternoon at the Sport Hall in Hamburg, the venue with a deep cut, the second attack appealed to the complicity of the referee who gave Meinke a chance to clinch again and again, the visitor allowing the court to work and win seconds with each attack. After the battle, the scorecards were at 114-114 and two unexplained 118-110 to and 119-109 to for the new monarch, the new champion, who did not hide her surprise with a tremendous difference. This doesn't stay here. Surely the IBF will be asked for a review. So they think they were robbed. And they think the ref should have deducted Nina a point for the constant clinching. But I warned ahead of the match that because it's going down in Germany, whatever consideration Nina can get, she will get. That's the way it is. That's the way it works. And it wouldn't have been no different if they were fighting in Argentina instead of Germany. The only difference is it would have been Daniela that got the consideration and not Nina. Though home field advantage is a real thing and I say it all the time. In this instance, it worked for Nina, and that's just how it is. Don't hate the player, hate the game. This wasn't your run-of-the-mill women's boxing match. This wasn't for 10-2s, it was for 12-3s. So Daniela had more time than usual to take the fight out of the judges' hands. Nina Menke sported a cut, a bad cut for most of this fight that she suffered early. The aesthetic of the match was what I envisioned. Where Daniela is looking for a brawl, Nina Menke is looking to box, move and punch, use the ring. Durable. Nina Menke is durable. Nicknamed Nina the Brave, that is how she fought against a far more experienced fighter than she is and a persistent one, a durable one. Because Daniela's durable too. Stalking Nina Menke as she marches forward, closing the distance. Nina trying to create it to set traps and give herself room to work and time to breathe. Because if Daniela has it her way, they're going to spend all 36 minutes in the phone booth trading punches. That's what she likes. The prediction stuck. Nina Menke is this division's newly crowned IBF champion, one of three champions at this weight. There is, of course, the woman to beat unified champion Amanda Serrano, who will be facing Katie Taylor for the second time up there at 140 pounds in a few weeks. There's Amanda Serrano. There is Sky Nicholson, WBC champion, who will be defending her WBC title against Raven Chapman on the end of card, a better B versus B wall. And of course, there is Nina Menke. Who I don't begrudge being the benefactor of what could be home field advantage, home cooking. Because if the people at OR Promotions who promote Daniela Bermudez wanted their fighter to have that advantage, then they should have put the money up. If they didn't, and Nina's people did, those are just the breaks. Nina Menke was very productive last year. She fought three times last year. This was her first fight of this one. I don't know that there's all that much time left for Nina to squeeze in another fight given the competitive nature of this one because this was a war that she will need to recuperate from. If it were a walk in the park, if she won a lopsided decision, I could see, but this likely took a lot out of Nina trying to fend off Daniela Bermudez, so she's gonna need time to recover, and I don't know if she fights again 
in the remainder of this year. IBF champion going into the next one. Though hardly out of the woods. So in the latest set of IBF rank standings, Nina and Daniela were ranked at number one and number two. Nina just won. She's the champion now. And provided that she doesn't have to run it back, she doesn't have to fight Daniela Bermudez for a second time since they seem to be looking for a rematch. If they don't get it, Nina's not in the clear. She's not out of the woods. Ranked right behind them is Nigeria's own Elizabeth Oshoba. That's a dangerous fight. That's an even more dangerous fight against a more dangerous fighter than the one that Nina just fought. Elizabeth Oshoba, very statuesque, powerful, 126 pounder, unbeaten. Heavy is the head that weighs the crown. Ain't that what they say? Elizabeth Oshoba is likely going to be gunning for Nina Menke now that she's champion, and she's not alone. Whoever wins the Nicholson versus Chapman fight, and if by some chance Amanda Serrano were to return to the featherweight division, these are all fighters that could soon be gunning for Nina, because she's gonna have something they want. The featherweight division is a talent-rich, talent-dense, deep division. There are a lot of good fighters at this weight. Nina is one among them, newly crowned IBF champion. Congratulations to her, but she's just painted a target on her back by winning that belt. And I hope she's ready in men's middleweight news. As part of yesterday's Joshua vs. Dubois mega match, we saw Hamza Shiraz stop Tyler Denny over the course of two rounds, scoring two knockdowns en route to that. I went with Hamza to win the fight. Hamza is a fighter that I'm very much impressed with. I have been impressed with so far. I picked him to beat Ammo, and I picked him to beat Tyler. Tyler, who was coming off a career-best win over a then-unbeaten Felix Cash, who retired in his corner. I believe he retired in his corner after five rounds. Tyler was unable to elicit that same response from the very statuesque, powerful Hamza Shiraz. Six foot three at 130 pounds with great fundamentals. Piston jab and a cannon backhand. Managing the distance and keeping space while he does it. That's an elite quality. As well as landing the jab with some regularity and not falling in, not smothering while he does it. Keeping that pocket, that space between himself and Tyler to land the jab, consistently land the jab, bring over the backhand, having enough room to drive his punches and amplify their power. It's no wonder he dropped him two times. It's no wonder that he stopped him in two rounds. It's not messy with his output. Like what you see from some other fighters that are statuesque for their weight, like what you see from Brandon Figueroa or Sebastian Fundora, these long and limber fighters that like to play their opponents close to the chest instead of managing the distance. They can't. And so they often give up their height and length since they don't know how to use it, trading punches mid-range to inside. Seems like a cop-out to me for fighters that are so tall and so long to not use their physical dimensions to their advantage. They can't. Hamza Shiraz can. Hamza Shiraz does. Did that with Amo Williams. He did that yesterday with Tyler Denny. And as a result of that, he's becoming somewhat of a boogity man, a fighter that is avoided. According to Spencer Brown, they offered Chris Eubank Jr. $5 million for a Hamza Shiraz fight, addressing that rumor that's been around a while. He said, that's true. That offer was made, and that offer was made by Turkey LL Sheik through Ben Shalom, and it never came into fruition. Eubank didn't want to fight. So is it safe to say that Chris Eubank Jr. ducked Hamza Shiraz? That depends. Chris hasn't fought in about a year. He hasn't fought since the Liam Smith rematch. Is the expectation that Chris Eubank Jr., who hasn't fought in a year's time, is going to get up off the couch for a guy like Hamza, as that would be ill-advised? Do you look at that as being a duck? Do you look at Yanni Beck? And we've been talking a lot about this. Rumor has it Yanni Beck was offered in the neighborhood of a million or a little over a million dollars to fight Hamza, and somebody on his side turned it down. Both Jake Donovan, Kevin Ioli, and Dan Raphael reported the same story. Yanni Beck denies it. Yanni Beck said, joke of the year, if you said it, you must prove it. If you think that rumors are information, then no one sent me a contract. To which Dan Raphael responded, talk to your promoter, which says the offer was rejected. Well, didn't Egus deny all of this? He did, but Egus is not his promoter. Egus is his manager. Top rank promotes Yanni Beck Alam Kanalai. So what if... All these guys are telling the truth. That Yanni Beck never saw a contract, and neither did Egus, but it's because Top Rank killed the fight before it got that far. Why would they have done that? 
Well, maybe it's because he had a mandatory in the queue. He has a mandatory to satisfy an Andre Mikhailovic. Remember, these guys were supposed to have already fought back in July. Yanni Beck was under orders. Not at liberty to accept any offers for a voluntary title defense while he has to satisfy Andre as his mandatory. There's a lot that's left of the imagination, but that isn't. What we do know is he was supposed to have already fought Andre Mikhailovic as his mandatory, so if Top Rank rejected the offer, that might have been why. But didn't you say you think Top Rank might be sabotaging this guy? That's still a distinct possibility. Two, three, four things can be true at the same time. After this guy collapses, after he faints at the weigh-in, Top Rank might have decided they want to withdraw from the middleweight division. For them, it's just not worth it. Yanni Beck is not a big money maker. Almost nobody in the middleweight division is. The other two champions at the weight, Lara, Adamez, those guys can't draw flies to shit. What's it gonna cost you to get Yanni Beck, Alam Kanalai, those unification matches? What are those champions and their teams? What kind of money are they gonna ask you for versus what money the show is actually worth? That to top rank, doing those fights or trying to might be more trouble than it's worth. So it could all be true. It's all about when. Because that's what we don't know. When exactly was an offer made to Yanni Beck for a Hamza Shiraz fight? And was it in between the time that he collapsed for the Mikhailovic fight and the time it was rescheduled? Because it has been rescheduled. It's going down early next month. In Australia, as a result of No Limit Promotions beating out top rank at the purse bid by a suspiciously low amount of money. Just a thousand dollars. The difference between No Limits bid and Top Rank's bid was just a thousand dollars. 351,000 to 350. Away from all of that and that nominal margin, Yanni Beck Alam Kanalai is an unbeaten unified champion and Top Rank didn't put up so much as half a million dollars for this fight. So when a Top Rank only bids about 350,000 for an unbeaten unified champion, that communicates something. That communicates that they're not invested and they don't think you're a money maker. They're not putting up much money for your fight. If you were worth it, they would. If you were good for it. They didn't because you're not. They're not gonna break the bank for your fight because they know you're not a draw, you're not a money maker. Simple. If Yanni Beck takes care of business in Australia and he does to Andre what I think he's gonna do to Andre, a Hamza Shiraz fight in the United Kingdom as a Queensbury promotion is a distinct possibility because Hamza was already ranked number one by the WBO going into this weekend's fight. So he's in position to challenge Yanni Beck for what he's got. If Yanni Beck wins, if Yanni Beck loses, the story is the WBO title will go vacant because the WBO title isn't on the line. At least that's what the story was. There's something happening. There's something going on there. Brass tacks. I don't dismiss the possibility that Yanni Beck will stay unified champion in the Andre Mikhailovic fight. I think he can beat him. When he does, he may have to contend with Hamza Shiraz. That is a stiffer test, a more dangerous assignment. Don't forget, Yanni Beck is the guy who struggled with Denzel Bentley. It's not outside the realm of possibility that Hamza could beat him. It's just something to think about after this weekend's action. Now, as it pertains to the main event of that same show, the Joshua vs. Dubois fight and the Joshua vs. Dubois fallout, pro boxing fans via their own social media posted some of the things Daniel was called at different points in his career. Quitter. No heart. Fake champion. There is that to which Daniel Dubois had to overcome, and I'm sure he's going to be the darling now, the darling in some circles until they get tired of him because that's what people do. They build you up to tear you down. Veteran fighter, former champion, and cult hero Ricky Hatton is calling for Anthony Joshua to retire. Hatton told Fight Hub TV, I would like to see him retire. He's been a two-time world champion. He's done the country proud. I would like to see him hang his gloves up and enjoy his retirement. He's not exactly tearing Anthony down. No, no, he isn't. But some people are. 
Carl Frotch, who's never at a loss for words when it comes to Anthony, says Anthony Joshua will never be remembered as a generational great because he never fought Tyson Fury. Well, Tyson Fury never fought him. So the same applies to him, don't it? He also said that AJ got a beating of epic proportions by Daniel Dubois. It's mad, isn't it, how boxing goes? Heavyweight champion. He's had some decent fights. But there's not been any standout performances. He never fought Tyson Fury. Spencer Oliver on Talk Sports said the other day, He's beaten everyone in this generation. He's not. He didn't beat Usyk twice. He lost to Andy Ruiz. I know he got the rematch, but he's not fought Fury. This isn't the generational great. But Fury hasn't fought him either, so doesn't the same thing apply to Fury? Fury hasn't fought him. He hasn't fought Joseph Parker, Joe Joyce, Daniel Dubois. You can play this game with any of the somebodies at heavyweight. You can even play this game with Usyk. He never fought Deontay Wilder. But this isn't about any of them to Carl Frotch. This is all about tearing down Anthony. That's why it doesn't make sense. The way he got wiped out by a young Daniel Dubois, that's a shocking performance, really. That's a beating of epic proportions. And it was. It absolutely Absolutely was. Though Carl Frotch is not so much happy for Daniel Dubois as he is happy that Anthony lost because he doesn't like the idea that Anthony would have done more for the British boxing scene and had a better legacy than his own. Doesn't that also apply to Daniel? Not really. Daniel beating Anthony doesn't give Daniel Anthony's fanfare or his legacy, his career accolades. Anthony is a two-time heavyweight champion. He's done a lot for the British boxing scene. And for whatever reason, Carl Frotch doesn't like that. He resents that. He's not worried about Daniel. For Carl, it's not so much about Daniel because Daniel could lose his next fight. That's where the heavyweight division is. Daniel could lose that IBF title in his next fight or the one after that or the one after that. It's not about him for Carl. It's about Anthony more than Daniel because Anthony has the more robust resume, the legacy, the fanfare, the profile. Carl doesn't think he deserves it. He resents him for having it. Did Carl say these things about Tyson Fury when he lost to Usyk the same way that Anthony did? Did he say that Tyson Fury is not a generational great? Did he say that about Wilder? Did he keep the energy for them that he has for Anthony? You'll excuse me for saying so that I don't think he did, and so many dishonest, disingenuous individuals that tried to tag me yesterday for a veiled attempt at an I told you so moment over a prediction they never made, a fight that we never discussed. You guys tried it. Because Anthony lost, and they relish any and every opportunity to see him lose. So much so that you literally had people trying to have an I told you so moment yesterday when you should Schmucks didn't tell anybody anything. And that's why nobody listens to you. Try as you might to get them to when push comes to shove, people are fully aware of your dishonest, disingenuous nature as I am aware of Carl's. Anthony's not a generational great because there's one or two guys that he didn't fight. Well, the same thing would have to apply to Fury and Usyk and Wilder because nobody in this division's fought everybody what you can say about anthony is that he has fought more of them more of the somebodies than say wilder and to a lesser extent tyson fury for three years all tyson fury did was jerk off wilder inside of their bubble it's no less than i expect from carl frotch it's no less than i expect from anthony's detractors it's just the way these people are it's better not to listen to them they hate everybody